Well, in order to change, you have to have evidence of what you're changing to is better. You have to have this hope. And I think the problem is with a lot of people today is they don't have hope. They don't have hope that it's going to get better. I mean, they're, they're stuck in the cycle of whether it's debt, whether it's not being able to save, whatever it is. And they seem like they just, they just can't get out and they don't think that there's a way. You're listening to the Millionaire's Unveiled podcast, where you'll hear the stories and interviews of everyday millionaires. We'll unveil their decisions, their strategies, and their current portfolio allocation. Now to your hosts, Clark Sheffield and Jace Mattinson. Welcome back to another episode of the Millionaire's Unveiled podcast. This is episode number 183. Clark, how you doing? What's going on in your world? Good, doing well. Excited for this episode. We interviewed Rachel Cruz, what, I mean, a few weeks ago now, but fun to kind of get a different perspective about her, I feel like, in this interview. Yeah, totally. We get into, you know, what it was like to grow up in the, the Ramsey household and some money personality, discuss her new book, Know Yourself, Know Thy Mo- Know Your Money, which, by the way, the, she has graciously donated three copies for us to give away for to our listeners. So, if you're interested in that, write us. As always, millionairesunveiled at gmail.com, and uh, we'll put you in the drawing for for that book. We've got three copies, so there'll be a couple different winners this time. But great episode with her talking about money personalities and how, you know, what we do as we grow up and and develop these things and how they can change and and evolve over time. And it brings up another point, too. We've had a couple of reviews and, and emails written into us recently about, you know, having more women on the show. And, you know, it's something that, that we definitely would love to have more on, um, you know, and just for, for our listeners, I mean, we do as best a job we can to get a broad list of guests, you know, whether it's men, women, you know, immigrants, different professions, all sorts of ages, net worth, backgrounds. I mean, we really do. But a lot of, especially at this point in the the podcast, you know, a lot of them are inbound. And so... You know, if you're if you're a woman out there and and you're a millionaire and you'd like to be on the show, I mean, shoot us an email, millionairesunveiled at gmail dot com. We'd love to have you on the show, uh, for sure. I mean, we do, Clark. You, we do have what twenty twenty five episodes so far that have featured women. Yeah, women are a couple. So, it, I mean, it's fun. It's, we're always looking for more, and that's, that's fun to have Rachel come on talk about her upbringing. I mean. Interesting to think about what it would be like to have Dave Ramsey as a dad, right? <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Especially, I mean, all the stories, you know, over the years of growing up in that household and some of the stuff, especially that he's that you know, he tells about some of those early days, right? When he went through the bankruptcy and you know had the young kids and you know stuff that that you know people experience today, but it's definitely a a different way and and in, in thinking and. You know, especially what what he's done for the personal finance community and world, you know, in in this country. I mean, it's just crazy to to think about like what that would be like, you know, at five years old, seven years old, when he was trying to build that business and and you know doing what he was doing. But uh, definitely an interesting interview with her and getting some perspective and some color on some stuff that I don't know that at least I hadn't really heard you know from his show or in any of the interviews they've done together or anything like that. Have you? No, yeah, agreed. I, I think you, you, if I'm remembering correctly, you asked her, hey, what was it like to grow up with Dave Ramsey dad? So it's interesting. I mean, she's obviously done fantastically well for herself, written a few books, and she's one of their top personalities now and, and does a great job. So just a, a fun interview overall. It's, it, I mean, obviously, we had Chris Hogan on a couple of times. So yeah, but yeah, I, I agree with you. Information I hadn't heard before. Totally. So last week we had Taylor. You might remember him from episode number 27. At the time he had a net worth of $500,000 and now he's a newly minted millionaire. Comes on the show to do that million dollar holla. Uh, We discuss how he got there so quickly. You know, it's been only two, just a little over two years uh, from from going from 500 to a million. So we discuss how he did that and what his future plans are. Really great episode with him. And and obviously, we try to bring back a few guests here and there to, to kind of do some recaps and some updates. And, and he's one of them as, you know, crossing that million dollar mark. Uh, you know, let's talk real estate. It's hot right now. If you're interested uh, investing in some some multifamily commercial deals, shoot us an email, millionairesinveld at gmail.com. And also, if you've got a deal that you're you know interested in, in bringing to the table, we'll definitely put, pay a finder's fee for that. Uh, if we end up closing on it. 
We appreciate y'all tuning in the podcast week after week. Just wanted to read a review that we received uh, recently here in the last couple of weeks from from uh, iTunes. This is from Energy. Man, y'all energy is great. I enjoy this podcast more than most because of the knowledge and perspective that y'all give. Continue to do what you're doing. Much love. Appreciate that uh, energy. Uh, and, and also the, the one that wrote in about this being a great show. We really appreciate you. This show obviously would not happen without our listeners. So appreciate you sharing. We definitely will continue to bring on, you know, we've got so many phenomenal guests in the pipeline, but always looking for more. So if you're interested, shoot us an email at millionairesunveiled at gmail.com. And without any further delay, let's get into the episode with Rachel. Welcome to the show, Rachel. How are you doing? Doing great, guys. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, that's awesome. So I want to get into your book and your story a little bit. First off here, though, what was it like growing up with Dave Ramsey as your dad? And maybe, it, you know, you talk about these money classrooms in your new book. What was that money classroom like for maybe the first 10 years, the second 10 years of your life and, and, and beyond? Um, yeah, it's funny. A lot of people ask me this question of like, what was it like? And I always laugh because I feel like people just assume we had mutual fund birthday parties and budget camps every summer. And we were obsessed with money. And all we talked about was money because Dave is my dad. And in fact, I feel like kind of the opposite was true. They did such a great job of intentionally teaching us how money works, but in the ebb and flow of life. So there was never really this ever big sit down meeting about money and all of that. They really just took these everyday learnings and chose to communicate those to us as kids. And so I just, I look back on that and so appreciate the way they did that because it made money so real and so tangible and not this scary subject in life. So when I, you know, was 18 and went off on my own, I feel like I had such a good grip on that. And so that's one thing I always encourage parents that, you know, engage those conversations and that more is caught than taught. And mom and dad really did live out everything that they teach. And um, that was a, a huge factor into it. So, so yeah, so these money classrooms, as I was writing the new book, realizing that money is communicated in two ways, it's communicated emotionally and it's communicated verbally. And so I, I kind of came up with these four classrooms out of that basically little charts that that ends up making it kind of this quadrant. And so I talk about the anxious money classroom, the unstable money classroom, the unaware money classroom, and the secure money classroom. And so all of those have different verbal communication styles and emotional tolls when it comes to money. So I feel like I did grow up in that fourth money classroom, that secure money classroom, where it's verbally open and emotionally calm. And again, because mom and dad just had come out of bankruptcy. So yeah, those first 10 years... I mean, my memories were of not going out to eat, not going on vacation, hearing no all the time, going to consignment sales and garage sales for stuff. Like, I mean, it was that type of, of atmosphere, but you don't know any better, right? I mean, when you're 10 years old or younger, that's all the life you know. And it's, and that it is what it is. So never did I think, oh, I'm missing out or anything. So when it got to the next decade, which brought in, you know, middle school and high school, For sure. Mom and dad, they just, I look back, they put guardrails on their lifestyle. And as the company grew and dad's success grew, obviously financially, they were doing better and better, but they shielded that from us. I mean, they really did have these boundaries of lifestyle that they did not raise a lot. And so I always felt like a lot of, I mean, this probably sounds crude and I don't mean it to be, but I always thought that I had friends that were, you know, much wealthier than me. And now looking back, turns out I'm like, oh no, I bet mom and dad, they had no debt. Everything was paid for. They <laughs> doing great. And so, but I never knew that. You know, I always kind of thought, oh no, there's definitely people much richer than me. But, but as, you know, middle schoolers and teenagers, I'm thankful they did that because I feel like that took out a lot of entitlement and expectation. And so the last decade, I would say, um, I feel like, yeah, you kind of, I mean, when you become an adult, your parents hopefully, they are still your parents. Absolutely. But it almost can be this peer relationship, you know, now that I'm married and have kids of my own and we can have these way more detailed conversations about numbers specifically. I never did that growing up, but we talk numbers now. Uh, we talk situations now that we never would in those other two decades. And so I just feel like we've become more 
almost like peers in a healthy way. Again, not that I have not lost honor or respect for my parents by saying that, but um, I feel like we're able to have adult conversations, which is very fun and exciting. Yeah, totally. So you mentioned kids and of your own, and and I want to get into to how you've transitioned and being a working mom and all that. But just back on on these money classrooms, I'm assuming you're creating that classroom for your children. Are there certain things that that you had in your household growing up, maybe in that first decade, that you're instilling in your kids now, or or, or practices that you're doing? Yes. So one thing that Winston, my husband, and I are implementing that. You know, when I grew up, I was never given an allowance. I was always on commission. So you work, you get paid. You don't work, you don't get paid. And that was always just like a black and white concept to me. So the fact that people were just given money was, I, w- I was so taken back by. And that is one thing with our kids we have started doing. Ours are five, three, and one. So obviously the five-year-old grasps it. I mean, it's amazing how quickly kids can understand these concepts. And so she will go do chores and she'll ask, she'll say, okay, do I, do I get my dollar now? You know, so we like have this, we have not created it. We need to, but you know, a chore chart to kind of keep tabs on, Hey, here's what you're doing around the house. And yeah, if you work, you get money. And that that's, that's a big connection point that I want my kids to understand. Cause when they grow up just seeing money, whether it's literal cash, which is not around as much anymore, you know, being pulled out of a wallet or just seeing some card. It's like this magic card that you just swipe and you get stuff. Um, they never, you don't see that connection between that work and money. So instilling that in my kids is, is a big priority. That's awesome. So growing up, your mom did not work outside the house, correct? Correct. Yeah, she was home. And, and you've made the decision to do both. How did you arrive at that decision? And what is that like now for, for your life and your lifestyle? Yeah. I mean, I was doing this job. I've been doing it for 10 years now. And so when I was pregnant with our first, I just knew, I mean, I just, I love my job and I enjoy it. I, it's kind of a higher calling for me as well. I mean, it's just something I feel like I'm put on this planet to do. And I, and again, and I love it. Like it's not a burden for me. And so when Amelia was born, I still had the desire to work and I went back, I pulled back a little bit, travel and all of that. I didn't do it as much as I did before. And then when I had my second, I kind of kept that same schedule. But after my third, so Charles um, is 15 months now, so he's right over a year. And I was going back from maternity leave right when COVID hit in March. So it was like this weird transition of leaving maternity leave, but then COVID was happening. And honestly, during that whole period, probably the last year, I have felt myself for the first time really wanting to be home a little bit more and actually pulling back just a little bit work-wise. And again, COVID presented itself as a great kind of test run. I was like, oh, wow, this is kind of what I was thinking. Um, so I, I've learned and talked to many moms who are working and you know, there's, I've come to the conclusion there is no right or wrong. I mean, there, if you're a full-time stay-at-home mom, that is amazing. If you are a full-time working mom, that is amazing. There is not a right or wrong. And I have learned from women that have done this before me that there's seasons, there are seasons in every part of life. And I feel like I'm kind of just now, so it's funny you asked this question. I feel like I have entered a little bit of a new season for me that I have my three kids, you know, my oldest is in kindergarten. And again, Charles is right over a year. And I'm like, man, these young years are so precious. And so I actually have pulled back a little bit. I'm not in the office as much. And I have made that decision. Uh, and I think, you know, in the next couple of years when they're all in preschool or, you know, kindergarten, my life looks a whole lot different. And that's a totally different season when all your kids are in school. So I'm kind of taking it a little bit like that. And I feel like that's given me the freedom to make decisions because I feel like women today feel like we can't off ramp or it doesn't feel like society says, oh, yeah, you can off ramp for a little bit and then come back on. And I kind of was getting frustrated because I'm like, why? Why can't we pull back? And people think I'm crazy when I'm like, no, I think I am going to pull back. Like, no, no, you know, everything's like going great. You should keep going. And I, I don't know. I just, I feel it in my heart that I'm like, no, I think I am. And so I'm kind of taking this chance to say, you know, I'm still going to do things. You know, obviously we're doing this interview right now. I mean, I still am plugged in for sure, but not to the level um, that I was, you know, five years ago before kids. Yeah, it's a good point. And also just some of the women that I talk to that are working and have kids and are trying to to balance it. It's like, how can I still find meaning if I'm only working two or three days a week, right? Like I don't feel as engaged in my career as I was when I was working five days a week. 
So I think maybe sometimes finding that fulfillment is hard as well. Yeah. Oh, for sure. For sure. And, um, you know, it's, it's always a struggle. I mean, I think for women, it is hard, you know, as a mom, like it is your number one role, but when you do have other passions and other things that you're like, no, I want to do this as well. You have to really find that good balance. And I feel like the word balance is always thrown around and it's so hard, but I always, I use Christy Wright's quote all the time. I love it. She said, life balance is not about being 50, 50. It's about being 100% present. And yeah. that's the thing I've really leaned into that when I'm at work, I'm working, I'm working. And then when I'm home, I'm home and I'm mom. And those boundaries you can put, whether it's, you know, checking email or on your phone, when you have those boundaries in life, I feel like you're able to squeeze out every ounce and the, and the quality of your time together is so much better wherever you are, whatever role you're playing in that moment. It's getting harder though, right? Because everything's so accessible now, email on the phone, like you just mentioned. Oh, it is. And I, I mean, you, you give people permission on how to treat you is what I've realized. And so if I am answering emails at 9 PM, people know, okay, I can get to Rachel at 9 PM, but if they don't get that email until 7 AM, you know, that next morning, if I wake up and check email first thing, they know, like you kind of have to set those boundaries and even verbalize them at times if you need to, because, oh yeah, your, um, your life will get sucked away. I just finished John Montcomer's book, the, the ruthless elimination of hurry. And it just, wow, it was so convicting. So I'm like, it is, we're attached to our technology. We are always available and it can become a problem. It's like, we were not created to live this life, you know, 24 seven. And so really pulling back, it's just, I think it's good care for ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. So let me just, we'll get more into the book here, but let me just jump back to these money classrooms that you mentioned in the book and and you, it's really what you call, right, money classrooms, which is the foundation of kind of the money environment, if you will, that you grew up in. So as, as you look back at, at the money classroom that you grew up in and also what you're teaching your kids, when is the appropriate time to start talking to your kids about, hey, this is how much I have? At, at what point should those conversations be have? I understand it's different for everybody, but what's your take there? Yeah. I mean, I don't think kids need to necessarily know numbers. I think principles are the biggest point of teaching for kids. They need to understand working and giving and saving and spending, and they need to, they need to understand generosity and they need to understand contentment and they need to understand, you know, these type of principles, I think is really what's important to teach your kids. Cause no matter what amount of money is involved, the principles still stay the same And so, yeah, I mean, numbers specifically, I don't feel like it's even necessary to talk about them. Um, Again, every circumstance is different, but until they're, they're, I think, you know, 18, 19, 20 years old, and depending on the level of numbers you have, you may have to discern, can my child emotionally handle, you know, that level of responsibility. (laughs) So I feel like it could be kid by kid as well. Yeah, yeah, totally fair. So, okay, your new book, Know Yourself, Know Your Money, as you finished writing this and as you talk to people about it, is there something that stood out to you, a key takeaway, maybe a new insight that as you were putting this all together that stood out to you? I think the whole premise of the book was really interesting for me because, and that's why I wanted to write about it, because talking about the how-to of money is really important to understanding how money works, right? So everything from how to budget, how to get out of debt, how to save, how to invest, how to refinance, how to give, all of those are extremely important. But until we understand the why, why we're doing the things we're doing with money, are we going to get to the root of the problem? Because so many life problems masquerade themselves as money problems. And that's what I've realized by doing this for 10 years. I'm like, you know, it's not always that you just have a budgeting problem and you can't stick to a budget. It's that you actually have a contentment problem or you have a problem saying no with boundaries or you have a planning problem. Like you have other issues going on that comes out as a budget problem, but it's not. Or, you know, money fights is a huge problem in marriages. And you look at that and you say, okay, really a lot of the time it's not just the money issue there. There are rooted issues that you're lacking communication, you're lacking empathy, you're lacking respect, you're lacking opinion, like you're lacking things in the marriage and they come out as money. And so that was just one that those are kind of findings is what I love to dig in into for the book of, Hey, let's go behind the why. And if we can get to those root problems, that's, what's going to be able to change our money habits. So, so digging into that whole premise was something that I loved learning about and, and figuring out in my own life and for the book, but as well as, you know, I talk about fear in the book. That's a really big one that I think is important 
uh, understanding our money fears and how that drives and motivates us. So that learning was fun uh, to dig into. So yeah, I mean, all, all the subjects, I just, I'm so fascinated by this whole concept. So that's, again, why I wrote the book. But I think it's just important to get into that root system of our hearts and why we handle money the way we do. Yeah. So let's go into that. You mentioned fear and then motivation. So let, let's t- let's start with fear. Fear is interesting because it, it can be both a good thing and a bad thing, right? On one hand, it's like, okay, I have the fear that I don't want to not have money, right? I don't want to be poor. I want to be able to save money and that can drive making good decisions. On the other hand, it's, hey, I don't want to invest my money necessarily, right? If you think of somebody who didn't want to invest in 2010 because there had just been a stock market crash, so they say, oh, I don't want to invest my money, and then they miss out. So fear, it's just interesting because it can go both ways, right? Yes, you're exactly right. I, I talked to Dr. Chip Dodd about this, about fear for this section of the book, because his take on it, which I loved, he said, fear is your body's literal response that you are in need of something. So when a fear rises up and you feel it physically, like that, it is your body saying, hey, I am in need of something. What do I need? And when that fear becomes paralyzing and it's so overwhelming or it turns into anxiety, that gets unhealthy. I don't want that. But when you have this fear that says, hey, yeah, here's a red flag. You know, in 2020, 40% of Americans couldn't cover a $400 emergency in cash. And so if you were furloughed or you lost your job and you were that statistic, yeah, you're going to be fearful to say, wow, how am I going to be able to make you know bills this month? How am I going to be able to buy food? And that, that should tell you, hey, I need to put things in place with my money. I need to actually change the way I've been viewing this and handling my money so that I don't have this fear again. So it helps kind of mitigate it. And again, I don't want it to be paralyzing for people, but I do want it to be able to say, hey, it could be your wake up call to say, I can do something different with my money and actually win in this area. Yeah. And then goals, let's talk motivation because, so we've interviewed, let's see, what what are we at, Jay? It's a couple hundred millionaires, right? And they talk about their stories, what motivates them, their allocation, et cetera. Similar, I think, to Dave's Millionaire Theme Hours, but we just do it for an hour or so. But a lot of them, when I say, okay, what was your motivation early on? They know what it was. It was, hey, I didn't want, I grew up poor and I didn't want to be poor right? Or I have three kids and I wanted to give them the life I didn't have or whatever it may be. It seems like early on, they really knew their motivation. And then when we say, well, what's motivating or driving you now after they're worth two, three, four million or a million, and they feel like they have a little bit more of their financial security, that's a little bit of a harder question for them. And so motivation can change through the years, it seems. Yes, absolutely. I think so, for sure. I mean, you're you're growing as a person and the way you view life even can start to change and your priority shift. And yeah, it, and it does. I mean, it's the outcome of what you want, but having those dreams and those goals out there to still continue to motivate you is really important. When I wrote the savings part of this book, I went through giving, saving and spending on why we do those things and, and realizing, yeah, when you're not dreaming and you're not having goals, it's harder to save. But when you do have these things like, yeah, I want to hit this or I want to do that, it's easier to save. And and I find that even with my husband and I, I mean, we one of our huge goals was building a house. And so we moved in, gosh, it was a year and a few months ago. And that took a long time to save for and through the process of actually building. And we talked about, you know, that was a huge goal for us. And how fun it was, honestly, like the, the, like the last check we wrote of that last draw, we were like, wow, I cannot believe we just did that. And it was, it was a boost in our marriage, <laughs> but then, and then I had fatigue cause I'm a spender. And so I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so done saving. Like I'm ready to get back and like go enjoy life again instead of hunkering down and saving all this money. And so I was like, I don't want to, I don't, I told Winston, I was like, I don't want any goals for four months. Like, I just want to enjoy our income. <laughs> and go back to not having to worry about every little dollar is what it felt like. And, (laughs) and after a while I thought, okay, now I kind of want my new thing. Like I need something to work towards. So that, yeah. So the motivation of that future and your, and your big, why, why do I want to win with money? Uh, it is going to shift and change throughout life. I do believe that for sure, but still having that, gosh, it's still so, so important. 
Yeah. So that's at the end of the book. You talk about what motivates you to save, what motivates you to spend, and then what motivates you to give. And when you understand each of those, you can make better decisions financially. So again, this is Know Yourself, Know Your Money with Rachel Cruz, about 237 page book. You mentioned different money personalities and you just said, hey, after we built the house, I wanted to spend a little bit. Oftentimes when we talk about money personalities, we'll say, oh, they're a saver or they're a spender. Is it bad to be classified as a spender? (laughs) <laughs> no, I'll, st- I'll stick up for all my spenders out there. Um, no, <laughs> these money tendencies, I write about seven of them in the book, and neither one is right or wrong. Now, when you go to the extremes on both ends, that can get unhealthy. And so finding sort of that medium ground, if you can, I think is, is the best place to be, but you're naturally going to lean one way or the other. So for savers, yeah, they, I feel like they always get the badge of honor. In personal finance, people are like, oh, you're a saver. Good for you. You know, you're the good one of the group. Uh, but savers, honestly, if you go to the extreme of that, that's unhealthy. I mean, you're you're living your life with a closed fist. You don't spend. You're not naturally always a, a generous person because you just hold money tightly. You hoard money. You have this level of safety that you think money is going to bring you in life. To the, to the nth degree. I mean, like it can get unhealthy if that's all you are. And then same with spenders, right? If you spend everything you make, you're going to be broke. You can't do that. And spenders, we tend to cope with spending. I mean, spending feels good. And when you lean that way, you can naturally say, oh yeah, I'm just going to make this little purchase here or there. I mean, that was, I mean, I hate to say it, but it's true. During quarantine, Oh, I was on Amazon every day, just scrolling and yeah, I'll get that. Sure. Why not? Okay. You know, I just, you end up spending because <laughs> you're bored or you're yeah. stressed. And so, so spenders, we have to watch out and make sure that that does not become coping mechanism because it easily can. What are your favorite things to spend on? Me? Oh, oh gosh. I'm, this is, I'm such a, I'm such a woman the in this. The I, do love clothes. I do love clothes. I love, yes, house stuff. So even kitchen things, if there's like a set of dishes that I see, I'm like, oh, I would love those. And then I'm in it, but I'm an experienced person. I enjoy, that's one of the tendencies I talk about experiences or things, but I am more of an experienced person. I, I will spend money on a vacation. I love a great vacation. I love like going to the zoo with my kids, for instance, like I will buy memberships at places all the time. So I'm like, oh yeah, we'll come back all the time and enjoy this. So I, I probably thrive and spend more money on experiences in life. I would say. Are, are you the only spender in your family? Um, of, of your but, siblings, but my siblings. Uh, yes, I'm definitely probably the, yes, I'm probably more the extreme spender. And actually people don't think this, but it's true. Dad is a big spender. <laughs> he's more of a spender than a saver. My mom's the saver. And was it always that way? Yes. Yes. Wow. For sure. Uh, but he's the nerd. So we also have another tendency and I call it the, or we call it the nerd and free spirits. And so the nerd loves to do the budget. They love the math side of it all. And that's my dad. Like he loves that. So he, so he's like the spender nerd. And my mom is the saver free spirit, if that makes sense. So totally, so it's a little bit of a different thing, but yeah. Um, so I'd say dad and I for sure are probably are the biggest spenders in the family, which is so funny that we're the ones that teach this stuff every day, but yeah. Interesting. <laughs> So one of, one of the final things you hit on in the book is, is changing money habits. How does somebody go about doing that? And, and what's your advice for somebody who needs to change their habits? Well, in order to change, you have to have evidence of what you're changing to is better. You have to have this hope. And I think the problem is with a lot of people today is they don't have hope. They don't have hope that it's going to get better. I mean, they're they're stuck in the cycle of whether it's, debt, whether it's not being able to save, whatever it is. And they seem like they just, they just can't get out and they don't think that there's a way. And so to believe that I have the ability to change the way I'm handling my money, I have the ability to change the way I even think about money and the way I view it, all of that, I can change that. But what I'm changing to has to be better than my presence because change is hard. I mean, I think we all experience this. It's 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 not fun. Most people, we enjoy living in what we know and what's comfortable. Even if we know it's wrong, it still feels good. 
I mean, my, I remember I took the car seats out of my car, uh, I don't know, a few months ago. And when I put them all back in, I had switched my toddler seat and my infant seat. And so I was loading up my kids and my three-year-old just threw this absolute fit. Cause she's like, no mom, this is not my side of the car. This is not my side of the car. This is not where I'm supposed to be sitting. This is not my side of the car. And I said, Caroline, you have to get in. We're going to be late. And I just thought in that moment, she hates change. Like we all do not like change. And so it's uncomfortable, but I would, I would propose to someone listening that if you're not happy with where you are today with money, you have to believe that you have the ability to change and push through the uncomfortable parts of that to get a better outcome to say, you know what, for, you know, for finally, I'm going to actually live on a budget and be intentional with my money. I'm finally going to work my way out of debt. So my largest wealth building tool, which is my income comes into me and I get to decide what to do with it versus it going back out 18 different directions. I am finally going to choose to give something, even if it's a little right now, but start focusing on that side. I mean, you can, you really can, you can change your money habits, but you have to have hope that it's better than what you're currently experiencing. Totally. Once again, that's know yourself, know your money. And and Rachel, appreciate you giving away three copies to our listeners. We'll, We'll have those in the show notes, how you can enter. Once again, that's Rachel Cruz, know yourself, know your money. Appreciate you coming on the show today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, you guys. I appreciate it. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks for listening to the Millionaire's Unveiled podcast with Clark Sheffield and Chase Mantinson. For more stories, investment opportunities, and information, check out our website at millionairesunveiled.com. See you next time when you'll hear from another everyday millionaire.